somebody's got to talk. Mm -hmm. You know, when you when you're when you're upset with something, you're dealing with a crisis, and in your own mind makes a disjunctions either or, either or. That's not a hermeneutic circle. That's a vicious circle. You go around and around and around and around and around and around, and you see no way out. No one's in a dilemma. Right. What you need is to talk to someone, not just anybody. You don't want to talk to Cassius, but you want to talk to <laughs> somebody like that. But you need to talk to somebody who can really listen, that kind of that <coughs> deeper listening that Heidegger talks about, who is really fully present. Tell me, I'm here for you, she said. Poor she said, I'm here, tell me. What's bothering me? Un, um, unfold your heavy heart. You know what? You trust me. Please. Uh, yeah, I don't know who was first. So. Go ahead. You decide. All right, good. Please. Yeah, which historical <clears throat> references do you believe uh, Shakespeare based is used, used when framing the story? Yeah. And why from those resources did he choose to approach, to approach a historical account okay. from the angle you propose. Yeah, good. That's a great question. That's a great question about interpretation and reception. It's a complicated question. So let me uh, begin by saying, <clears throat> uh, my, tell you what my assumption is in responding to yours. It's Clifford, Clifford Gertz's uh, notion in uh, structural anthropology, reality is an ensemble of texts. It's a story about a story about a story about a story. So the sources that Shakespeare had were principally for Julius Caesar, Thomas, Thomas North translations of Plutarch's parallel lives of famous Greeks and Romans. Um, so uh, North's book is published in uh, 1589, which is just about the time that Shakespeare writes Caesar. It's an early play, 1590s. So it's, I'm sorry, 1579. So it's, it's about a decade uh, in circulation. And then Plutarch, uh, is writing in the first century. So he's writing after the event that occurs. So um, he takes essentially uh, the story from um, North's translation of Plutarch, um, as far as we can tell, um, and then takes poetic liberties with it. Uh, for example, um, the, uh, the time is contracted in Shakespeare. Uh, Antony speaks before the crowd uh, uh, immediately after the assassination, and the account in North and Plutarch was it's a year after. So he alters those things. Now, in terms of the play itself, the context of the play, uh, there's nobody who is perfect in this play. Even Antony, I mean, that speech is amazing what he does. You know? Listen, I'm not having <laughs> That wonderful, that wonderful conceit. I'm not going to talk about his good qualities. I'm really not. There's no need for me to get into that. And then does it. And the crowd is not aware of it, aware that it's happening. It's beautifully done. Um, but um, uh, uh, Antony is honest and has integrity at that moment because he's, he's lifting the assumption to the surface. And he's speaking from his heart. This is what this man means to me. This is who Caesar is for me. He's done all of this. You know, he's brought home riches from conquered territories and enhanced the, the, the coffers, the treasury of Rome. Uh, and he's been willing to lay down his life and so on. He's been an extraordinary, extraordinarily generous Roman, an ideal Roman. Um, but then very quickly in the play, uh, in Caesar, well, Antony has integrity, but when Antony and Octavius are fighting Brutus and Cassius, Antony needs money for the truth. He says, well, I wonder if we can use some of the money that Caesar passed on to the general populace. You know, he left everybody a sum of money. Um, and he does that without saying, well, this is dishonest to be able to do that. So you have... Uh, you have uh, all of the characters tainted in some way. There's nobody there who is you know, really uh, a kind of perfect person. Um, how is Plutarch about Brutus? Do you, do you know how Plutarch feels about Brutus? 
how does he, how does Plutarch treat the character of Brutus? Positively, um, negatively? No, it's not. Uh, it is not positively in in Western literature. You know, Brutus is in the inner circle of hell with well, two. Dante, though. Yeah, well, yeah. I'm talking about Plutarch. Yeah, no, I know Dante. But what I'm saying is in Western in Western intellectual history, he is not a heroic figure. Uh, he is an evil figure. Uh, so there's Brutus, Cassius, and the Judas, who are at the very center. Uh, because they, did, you know, that's the cardinal sin in Dante, when you betray someone's trust. And uh, Judas betrays the, the, the trust of Jesus, who is the, you know, who is the, uh, the authority, uh, who is the um, uh, king of the sacred world, and um, Cassius and uh, uh, Brutus betray Caesar. Thank you so much for coming. Thanks for your question. Uh, who betrays the, uh, uh, the leader of the secular world, Julius Caesar? So, you know, these, so in you know in in uh, it's in Plutarch, it's in it's particularly. Brutus is a very evil man. And of course the phrase, a tu Brute, is used, and you too, Brutus, you whom I've trusted, you whom I felt close to. And in that moment, Caesar gives up, you know, throws the, the, uh, his toga over his head, and just, just, uh, submits to the orgy of death and murder. I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, did, I, did I answer? I'm sorry. Sort of. It's yeah. fine. I, I guess it's. I, I, I was unaware how much speculation you had made why Shakespeare chose this historical event to insert this theme of the hermeneutic, hermeneutic yeah. circle. Yeah. Uh, you know, there are four Roman plays there's Caesar. Titus Andronicus, Antony and Cleopatra, and Coriolanus. And they're all concerned with issues of power, dominance, control, government, and legitimacy. Who is the legitimate leader? That was also a, uh, a, a sustained discourse in, early modern, in the early modern period during the time of Queen Elizabeth because of the civil war between the House of Lancaster 30-year war in the 15th century, and, uh, and, and Shakespeare does with that as well in the history plays. All the history plays are about legitimacy and attempting to establish the legitimacy of uh, the, the monarchical system, that this is really the king, this person, and, and uh, Queen Elizabeth is really a queen. Um, and so, you, you know, you have all of the turns and counter turns, all of the breaks, the gaps, the disruptions. Uh, Henry VIII, you know, starts his own church because he wants a boy, and marriage life, and, and so the Shakespeare's trying to say, well, "What? What can I do with this guy? You know, I gotta, I gotta make Queen Elizabeth look good. So let me, let me write a play. He wrote not one play, but he wrote eight plays about the theme of legitimizing uh, authority in the state, and uh, he looked to Rome too as well, which was the a symbol of power and refinement and civilization. It was the center of the world for so long, for 500 years. Um, and uh, uh, so it was in, so I think this is his, the, the play is tremendously complex and you can explore it from different perspectives. But the thing that got me here was that, uh, as I read it again in this readings, and I had never seen that scene that way before. I mean, we don't, we think of Romeo and Juliet, Anthony and Cleopatra, uh, Othello and Desdemona, you know, extraordinary love relationship. And whoever hears, you don't hear of Brutus and Portia. Who? Brutus and Portia. Is it a rock group? Brutus and Portia, let's see. Um, but it is very, very powerful when you, when you read those lines and see what he's, what she's offering him, and he doesn't get it. He doesn't understand what she's offering him. Just talk. So all we're doing is talk. No, no, no. We're doing something more than talking. It's you and I who are talking here, and we come from a set of premises about what we're doing here. You know, 
I'm listening, I open to your horizon of experience and so on. It's just not just Cassius's method, which is that I want to I need I want to get what I want here, and I'm willing to do whatever I can to get what I want. Slide, cheat, I take bribes, you know, I'm gonna bribe somebody too. Did you, did you thank you, dear. Okay, uh, thank you for coming. That was terrific. I think that um, those people missing this day had an excellent talk. But listen, as you say, it was made up by the responsiveness in the class. <laughs> and it's not the number, it's the quality. <laughs> well, this Actually, let me, let me ask about Anthony. Because you said that the people, the public, are listening to him, but they don't quite understand what he's doing to them? No, they're convinced. No, that's it. <coughs> yeah, okay, I that's think it. you see it. You see, look at the text. And I don't have, you know, this. the text goes on. Uh, in here, you don't see it. Uh, Anthony, there, there, okay. I haven't seen this, this in is the, 30 years and read it since 10th grade. Right, 10th grade. Yeah, this is which the, is just a few years ago. Right. No, but this is the, this is the one that is ch chosen for high school, but it's not. You know, it, I. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, there are lots of possibilities here, but you don't see it here as much as you do after this sequence. It continues because he hears he hears the the crowd saying, uh, maybe, maybe he has a good point. Uh, yes. And so he, he invents on the spot. This is real improvisation. On the spot, dead spot, he invents the next thing to say. But it's in the listening. It's back and forth. So it's and not really, in that sense, it's not an oration, no. but more it's of a, a conversation That's with the I'm, public. Yeah, it's, a, it's, a dialogue. it's actually a dialogue. You know, you get through the first part because Brutus spoke just before Anthony does. And Brutus says, listen, we had to do this because Brutus was an ambitious person and he would have been a tyrant. And he wraps the crowd in that belief. So when, when Antony comes to speak, they're already hostile. Yeah. But he knows it. Yeah. You see, he knows what their horizon of understanding is. Antony is the, and then very cleverly, he does this, this wonderful trope. You know, I'm just going to do here a little service for the deceased. Ah! And I'm not going to say anything nice about him at all uh, because I have to keep my word to Brutus. And Brutus is an honorable man. So, and he begins, he does it eight times. Oh my God, by the time you get to the eighth one, you can see him screaming. They're not honest. You know, they are lying. Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, Dr. Jones. I'm cut it. But um, it seemed like when Anthony was talking to the crowd, he's already wrapped up in emotion already because he just saw his friend dead yeah, at, the yeah. at the statue. And I was wondering how much of it, because first of all, the audience were overwhelmingly plebeians, so yeah. obviously uneducated. They weren't statesmen, they weren't right. diplomats, they were people who were just regular people who were probably unaware of the inner, like, all this um, yeah. conspiratory actions. Yeah. So he does the speech. It's really more or less like a play upon um, Brutus and um, Caesar's relationship, okay, well they were friends and and it was a misunderstanding somewhere, I don't know why, and, and it seemed almost kind of snide because, okay, you're trying to appease the people, but he says, well, I think wasn't Casca still there to witness the uh, speech? Because I know Brutus yeah, told the people, stay so, here and listen to Anthony right. speak. But yeah. Cassius was in another part. Come no, no, Casca. Casca. Oh, Casca, yeah. Casca. Yeah, so there were still some conspirators who were yeah. over listening, listening this, right. and it seemed like he was really snide towards them, like, right. yeah, well, they're honorable people, like, quote unquote. Right. And then towards the end of the speech, he, well, first he shows them the dead body, right. you know, and then lets them know, okay, well, you got parks to your name and you got some money coming your way. Yeah. So it seemed like. It wasn't totally altruistic. No, it's no. not. You know, it's like okay, I'm I'm about to manipulate you because you're not you're not right. that smart anyway. You got money and your 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 guy is dead. So what you gonna do? And then tells the people, okay, well if I was a different sort of Brutus, I would tell you all to go and mutiny. It just seemed like right. it was so layered in yes. in a sarcasm right. and manipulation right. that it was just 
but mask as okay well i'm doing you a service here and i'm not about to tell you right. the good that he's done in the end he does right he does it just seems so layeredly brilliant it and yeah, manipulative it that's exactly how i see it layeredly brilliant that's a wonderful phrase for it that's what he does and you know with the with the inheritance he holds back because he says comes out with the will and he says, I want to tell yeah, you. Yeah, he teases them. He, 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 right. he said, and they said, read the will. I said, well, will you let me read yeah. the will? Yeah, you know? Yeah, I, can't, I really can't read the will. I can't read the will because it will be, it will, it will, it will be disrespectful to them. Right. They, you know, they, they weren't, they, they stabbed Caesar, by the right. way, but it will be disrespectful right. to the honorable <laughs> men. By, by the way, yes. And you will notice the robe here as he steps down. There are holes in the robe where they stabbed him. But at that point, he could say anything because he got them. He got them. And, but the will finally come because they're screaming for him. They're ready to riot. And he says, wait, 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 don't go. Don't leave yet. I want to read you his will to confirm it. And he gets them there. So it's a moment of glory for him. But then, you know, Antony develops in, in, in Antony and Cleopatra mm -hmm. that uh, he gives up everything, everything for the woman. There's an interesting thing to take those. Just, that's a wonderful idea that you just given me. It just came to me. I never thought of it before. But the two relationships, Brutus and Portia, Antony and Cleopatra, mm -hmm. that Antony gives up everything, power, for Cleopatra. And Brutus does not give up his wife, uh, does not give up throne for his wife. But it seems like another interesting parallel is Brutus and Cassius. That seems to me like the un spoken love story for because everything that his wife he wasn't able to give his wife he was able to be seduced by this idea of Rome yeah. that I felt that he felt that Cassius represented yeah. even though he was a shady character and yeah. knew he was shady yeah. but that whole tense scene just showed everything because there were moments yeah. where Cassius broke down yeah. and that was a moment for Brutus to kind of like manipulate it and con condescend the situation. He's yes. he's he's baiting them on and yeah, you know saying, well, you know, I'd rather bay at the moon than be a Roman than yeah. be such a Roman. So yeah. it just seemed like there's like this, you know, there's points where Cassius is manipulating Brutus upon his play of Rome, right. and then and then there's points where Brutus is manipulating Cassius on him being like inept. Or like, oh, you love Caesar more than you love yeah. me, and all this, and then the whole melodramatic, oh, well, stab me like yeah. you did Caesar, where you're the one who told me to kill Caesar yeah. in the first place. So it just seemed like really diabolically yeah. manipulative. It, it was, and it's it's uh, really uh, the kind of conversation that that people have when the relationship is dying, where they say anything, you know. Well, you know, let me tell you what I think of you. Let me tell you what I think of that. And then it got, it got lower and lower and lower. It became a street fight finally there. Um, and, but it was that moment, of course, when he takes out the knife that, that they both realized, we're supposed to be leaving the army in a few seconds. We have to do something to pull it together as well. So that's great. There's a wonderful Yes, I'm sorry. You didn't get to ask me a question. Go ahead. Did you have a question? Um, kind of. Oh, oh, comment. Yeah. I mean, like, I think it's pretty much half of what it used to be now. All right, you kept on bringing up trust throughout the talk. Uh, so it was my takeaway then that Brutus basically lived in an era of distrust. I mean, even though he was willing to open up in his wife, he basically was completely willing to just shut off the last second. Apparently, this history he had with Caesar, he could be like, completely shut down just by just a bunch of words from Cassius, whom he even turns on, you know, near the end, you know? It's like, for all the ways he gets swayed, he doesn't seem to really trust anyone, yeah. number one. Yeah. yeah, I think that's a very sensitive observation. I think it is an issue of trust. Erickson says, by the way, Eric Erickson says that that is the, that's the platform, and it develops very early from birth to 18 months. Is this a trustworthy universe? And that's when the child comes to the conclusion. Exploring it, you know, if I put my fingers in these two sockets in the wall, I will have it. You know, if I, if, I, if I hurt, will somebody caress me? Will I be fed if I'm hungry and so on? And so every other relationship or every crisis uh, that a person goes through in childhood as well as the adult life phase development, too, the three main crises of adult life phase development, uh, has underneath it the issue of trust. So it's an issue here that is very, very relevant. Yes, he trusts his wife, but his fears dominate trust. He's, 
he even says, Caesar has given no evidence, in, in isolation, no evidence of being a tyrant. And he's been around all these years. And yet, we've come to the conclusion that not only has, not only is he ambitious, but he will enact that ambition in a tyrannical way. So there are conclusions they draw that are unwarranted by their uh, undiscussed assumption. Um, and yes, uh, they, are, mm, they are senators uh, and they are politicians. And they're very careful about what they say publicly. Uh, and so they've been, you know, with the seven, the, the, the seven of them are kind of huddling all the time. And, and Portia notices this and says, what's going on? You know? So even to talk about one, once he enters the group, enters that circle, then uh, he closes himself off from others, except for that one opening with his wife. He's got a chance to break out. And, and it's a... It's, it's about keeping secrets. It's about not talking rather than talking. It's about uh, uh, supporting the group and the intention of the group rather than exploring the whole question. Is this what, you, what, you, is this what you, we should be doing? You know, we're going to murder somebody. That's very, very serious. So they, they take the murder and they, uh, <clears throat> they don't deal with it directly, but they, they, they frame it in terms of the larger uh, political issue of Rome, that Caesar is a threat to Rome. And so the moral issue of murder gets obscured with the larger issue of if he becomes, if he becomes uh, uh, king, then we will lose our rights as, as Roman citizens because the Roman, the Roman Republic was not a monarchy. It was ruled by a consul and a senate and the plebeians, the, the ordinary people also had so there was a sense of representative government. That's what they were afraid of losing. And so there's this, you know, if, you know, that's a great, just a great question because you can ask, if Cassius were more trustworthy than the others, could they have had a debate? You know, as you were saying, could they have talked to you? Know, what's going on here? You know, might, you know, Caesar's so popular with the people. Many of the people want him to be king. What, what do you think of that? And is, as you said, Dina, is this a question we can bring up with Caesar? Can we go there and say, there's a lot of talk about making you a king. Uh, we'd like to be able to talk about that as members of the Senate, as members of this governing body. Not even thought, not even thought of at all. So I think quest, uh, you know, one, one can talk about it is, is trust is a subtext here. Uh, but the larger issue here think is the way in which we come to make sense of things. We don't make sense of this, what's going on here. Um, and, uh, and I think that's, that's I think what Shakespeare is dealing with. And I think Herman Her 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 really um, really brings that out. So good great question. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you all for coming. Wonderful comment.